Hey, hi guys. Uh, as some of you know, uh, my latest guest has sent me into hiding because I was very afraid of some of the stuff that she was saying. She argues that there is such a thing as biology. She even goes much further, argues that there's things like male or female. And as an evolutionary bi behavioral scientist, I know that that's an antiquated form of biology. We now know better. We have 873 genders, but I mustered up all my courage to speak to her. Abigail Schreier, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? G great. I'm, do I'm doing wonderfully uh, well, uh, especially because I was very excited to speak to you. So, uh, I mean, I won't go through all your bio, but you're a Yale Law School graduate, which of course means that you tried to get into Cornell, my alma mater. You couldn't. That's why you went to Yale. I understand. There's no shame in going to Yale. Uh, you're a big disappointment to your parents because they're both judges and you decided not to go down their path. Am I right there? Am I onto something? You are. <laughs> <laughs> I am. But we're here today not to discuss about why you have shamed your parents, but rather to talk about this book right here, Irreversible Damage, The Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters. And of course, I'm a bit upset because you you share the same publisher as me and it should only be me who is spotlighted. And yet you took a lot of my glitz and glamour. Congratulations on the success of your book, Abigail. Oh, thank you. I, I like to think we shared the spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, uh, my wife saw you on, you know, whenever we were watching, I don't know which show, maybe it could have been Tucker or so something like that. And uh, when I told her that I was speaking to you, she, just, she said, oh, she has such a nice way about her. So I'm, I think I'm going to start calling you the smiling assassin. Because, <laughs> right, because there is kind of, you have a personal style that I think is very endearing. I mean, you are a honey badger, right? I mean, I always implore people in chapter eight of my book, I talk about activate your inner honey badger. And you've certainly taken a lot of flack for writing this book. And yet you do it with grace, with poise, with a smile. And so I think that's a be beautiful set of traits to, to have. Uh oh, thank you. Please send my regards to your wife. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate uh, oh. that. Uh, sure. So, okay. So let's start with, why don't you give us, uh, you know, some people may not have had a chance to, to read your book or may not know what it's about. Give us a big sort of synopsis, however many, many minutes you need to go over the book. Go ahead. Sure. So basically there's something called gender dysphoria, which is the severe discomfort of one's biological sex. And we know what this is. We have a hundred year diagnostic history of it. And the surprise, and it always afflicted little boys. It came on in, in early childhood, ages two to four. A little boys saying, no, mommy, I'm not a boy, I'm a girl. Wanting to wear girls' clothes, do girls' things. And the majority of these kids always outgrow it. In the last decade, out of nowhere, across the West, we're talking about America, Canada, Sweden, England, um, the, there's been an explosion in this diagnosis, gender dysphoria, and it's overwhelmingly, out of nowhere, teenage girls. Teenage girls with no childhood history who are saying, I'm a boy. And they're um, getting, they're doing this with their friends, and they're, they are begging for hormones and surgeries, and they're easily obtaining them. So my question in the book was, why? What's going on here? Why are we seeing this explosion? And um, the hypothesis of the book, based on research of um, Dr. Lisa Lipman, as well as my own research, was that there's peer influence and social media influence involved that these are the same high anxiety, um, you know, high depression girls who in a previous era would have engaged in cutting and often do engage in cutting as well, but also anorexia and bulimia. And today, are, instead of saying, oh, I'm so fat, oh, I'm so fat, it's, oh, I'm supposed to be a boy. So, so there is a, they, they already start off with a set of mental health issues, which then become instantiated in this sort of new social environment where there are certain rewards that are reaped by assuming a trans identity. That's what you're arguing, correct? Yes, that's right. I mean, their pain is real. The important thing to know is their pain is real. These young women are in a lot of pain. But when girls are in psychological pain, they often don't know how to explain it to other people in a way that will get them attention and the, not just attention in a, in a superficial way, but the love that they're seeking. They're, they're really in pain. And the, they look to the culture to get, you know, for an explanation, but also in order to explain their pain in a way that will get them, you know, love and attention. And the way to do that today is by saying, you know, I have a new gender identity. Can I, can I offer, I, I mean, I, your, your hypothesis certainly sounds uh, reasonable. Maybe I can offer one that might go along with what you're thinking. Sure. Yeah. So uh, in, in, in the parasitic mind, uh, I talk about something called collective Munchausen and collective Munchausen by proxy, 
which uh, so the way I coined these terms is actually it stemmed from a paper that I had written in a I mean an academic paper a scientific paper that I had written in a medical journal where I was trying to explain Munchausen syndrome by proxy from an evolutionary perspective and so let me step back and explain those two uh, phenomena so Munchausen syndrome is a, a psychiatric disorder whereby someone feigns a medical illness so that they can garner the empathy and sympathy that would come with having such an illness. Munchausen syndrome by proxy is even, in a sense, more diabolical because you're taking someone who is under your care, your elderly parent, your pet, uh, most typically your biological child. Now you harm them so that you can garner that empathy and sympathy by proxy through them, right? Oh, poor you, you have a poor child. So having been familiar with those uh, psychiatric conditions, I then coined the term collective Munchausen and collective Munchausen by proxy to refer to sort of the orgiastic quest to seek victimhood that we see in the current zeitgeist. One of which might be, in line with what you're saying, that maybe these girls are engaging in a form of Munchausen uh, to garner sympathy for themselves. And the parents of those children who are very gender affirming, to use that term, are engaging in collective Munchausen by proxy. Oh, poor me, I've got a transgender child. How does that fit in within your framework? So I think that's really interesting, and I think and I think it does fit in. But but here's what I would say is the the only qualification: the most of the girls I looked at, um, the parents did, although they were progressive, they were politically progressive. They did not agree that this was the correct diagnosis for their daughters. So they actually, the parents were not going along with it, but they were undermined by the therapists they paid for, the doctors their daughters went to, the school teacher who promised them that, or, or that they were not affirming or surreptitiously started you know, introducing the child by a new name and pronouns, even let the girl sleep with the boys in the overnight trip um, without telling the parents. So, so most of the people I talked to, the parents were extremely alarmed. They did not think this diagnosis was correct for their daughters. And they were undermined completely from every turn, even by their own friends, when they tried to stop it. Wow. Now, the Littman uh, study that you mentioned is actually one that I also discuss in my book. I had actually reached out to, to uh, Dr. Uh, Littman uh, to offer her my platform as a, you know, to defend her. Uh, you know, I've sort of become known as someone who, when, when everybody else is afraid to speak to someone, they sort of turn to me. Uh, and then I say, yeah, sure, let's talk. Uh, and she, you know, she was very kind. She responded, but at the time, she was really overwhelmed by, you know, what was happening to her. I think eventually, didn't they? Did they retract the paper from Plus One, or what? What happened? No, they actually re-reviewed it and put a like disclaimer on it. They gave it a new title, uh, but all the conclusions were the same. So it's a complete lie that it was re that it was revised or retracted in any way. And it's also a lie that her methodology wasn't good. Right. Her methodology was perfectly good. As, as you all know, with, when you have children and adolescents at issue, they always interview parents to, because that's the only way to get a long you know, psychiatric history of a child. You can't ask the child, well, what, what were you like at five um, and get something accurate uh, with, with regard to a diagnosis. So um, all of that was really just calumny. Um, and, you know, I, she, she is a real scientist, so she is, a, I think, a, a fairly private person, but, uh, but, but a very good scientist and someone I, I really admire. Although, you know, in sort of the panoply of strategies that one uses to delegitimize someone, uh, I can already see if, it's, if it hasn't already happened. Well, she's, she's an OB... Uh, GYN, what the hell does she, right? So so there is no end to the number of ways that we can point to someone and try to attack and discredit the messenger. So surely that strategy would have been used on her, right? I mean, what does she know about psychiatric conditions? She's not a psychiatrist. That's right. I mean, it's it's amazing because all, all a Twitter user needs to do is to scream that there's, I mean, for instance, they lie about me all the time. They, for her, she does have a public health degree. She did a separate residency in that. She happens to also be an OBGYN, but she's also a public health expert. I mean, the, anyway, her credentials are impeccable uh, for this research, you know, and they, and they say the same thing about me. Oh, you're just a journalist. Well, of course, that's why I interviewed so many experts. Um, journalists do tend to write books right. about various right. subjects, including medical scandals, and this is one. Um, so, so that's ridiculous. But the other thing they have said about me online is I never talked to any adolescents, which is totally untrue. But they just they just circulate these lies, and one of the problems is today there's no repercussions. You can circulate lies 
and such a mass scale with no repercussions because our, you know, defamation laws are so weak, frankly, in the United States. I mean, I'm not familiar with Canada, but in the United States are so weak, it's almost impossible to sue for defamation. And they never envisioned a scale in which you can just disseminate lies that, you know, cause real, real harm. So let's let's talk a bit about some of that that you know the negative aspects of you putting your neck out there. Then we'll we'll go back to some of the con, you know the substantive content of the book. So uh, I, I was watching your Hillsdale College address. I think it was in May. Is that is that right? Was it? It was recently, right? Yeah, April maybe. Yeah, April. and I, and I'm, I guess I can now say, although I haven't publicly stated, I will be give, giving an address at Hillsdale in October if my oh. overlord. Justin Trudeau allows me to have personal agency. If yes, then I will go to Hillsdale. Uh, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Uh, I love the address. It was so good. It really offered a, a great synopsis of, of your book. Uh, but, you know, you, you talked about how, uh, oh, I'm not used to having an audience that's not throwing stuff at me. And, I, you, you know, you were joking about how it's, it's, it's not the typical sort of default value for you to be treated fairly and so on. So how how have you been able to handle? Is it just that your unique personhood, you know, you have thick skin and it can roll off your your shoulders, or do you struggle with the negative stuff that you know? Talk us through this. So first of all, I'm right, and that helps. <laughs> right, the, really the truth is a good defense. Yeah, the truth is a good defense. I mean. If, look, if I thought maybe I was wrong, I think I would, but but I don't think I'm wrong. And I think that more the, the amount of confirmation that has come out since my book was published is astonishing. I mean, I could never have dreamed that there would be several studies since, you know, uh, after Lisa Littman's confirming her research and then the Kira Bell case in England in which Kira Bell got up in open court and the court found that these protocols, which are virtually identical to the ones we have in the United States, were completely slapdash and we're leading to young women transitioning with a totally inadequate oversight on really, you know, troubling basis and, and making these, you know, you know, leading them to irreversible harm. So, um, there, you know, I've, I've gotten a tremendous amount of confirmation, but there's something else too. Um, I do think it's a sort of personality thing to some extent. Um, you know, I guess I'm less afraid of, you know, I'm certainly not afraid of the screamers online, um, but I, I'm, I'm sort of less afraid of a world in which I'm yelled at than I am in a world in which lies prevail. Wow, what I'm, a beautifully said. I'm much more afraid of that scenario. I'm much more afraid in which lies make their way into research, lies make their way into the practice of medicine, lies make us their way into the judiciary system. That is a is actually a very frightening prospect to me. So yeah, well, you know, there's a there's a, a set of papers that have come out. I think the original one was published in a journal called Judgment and Decision Making, which is certainly within my wheelhouse. Uh, maybe 2016, 2017, and it was they developed a psychometric scale, like a personality scale, that captures one's susceptibility to bullshit i mean and they literally use that term right so it, it's now become and as you may know there's a uh Har uh, not harvard princeton uh, philosopher that a few years ago uh frankfurt who had come out with a book titled on bullshit and so that term has now become sort of part of the lexicon of you know in academia so i wonder if there is a scale maybe that's a project that i'll i'll work on with some graduate student is a, a, a scale to measure uh, susceptibility to be triggered by bullshit, in which case I think both you and I, if I can speak for you, uh, would score very highly on because I think that w what you're saying is you're upset by attacks on truth, right? We, you know, we, we could, and, and as I always say, and I, I state in my book, look, I can be totally for these noble jo uh, just, social justice causes without ever ceding one millimeter of the truth in, in the pursuit of that noble goal. And I, so I think there's kind of a, a moral righteous indignation at being subsumed by bullshit. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, I think so. I mean, I, I would probably score very high on disagreeableness. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't tend to just go along. Um, you know, I don't know how much of it was just inborn or the way I grew up. I didn't grow up around Jewish kids. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a, a very integrated neighborhood, mostly with black kids. And so I was always sort of, um, although we all got along really well, I was always very, I was always different. I mean, I was like the only Jewish kid in public school. There was one other uh, girl in my class, but you know, 
Um, so I was always felt a little bit on the outside. Um, and so I suppose not being in everyone's good graces is not something I, I miss as keenly as maybe others would. Wow. So, well, but what you're saying basically, as is, you're exactly correct, that much of who we are is an inextricable mix of nature and nurture, right? So, so you know, you might have already started off with an innate, you know, proclivity to to be combative, to 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 speak your mind, and then whatever environmental realities that you faced only supported that. In in your case, growing up as quote the outsider. By the way, as a side note, it might interest you on a personal level. Uh, I also, I mean, I'm. For those who are listening and don't know, I'm also Jewish, and I uh, I was the only one of my four siblings who didn't go to uh, you know Jewish school throughout you know all my upbringing, and uh, in, in in my forties, my dad had come to um, to our house one day to visit, and he said, you know what I really regret about you know raising you is that I didn't send you to Jewish school. And I said, oh, that's funny, Dad, because that's the one thing that I can really thank you for. So that which you regret the most is what I am most happy that you did. And that kind of threw him in the loop. And I wasn't trying to be just uh, irreverent or, or you know, confrontational. But I think what it allowed me to do is that while I maintained a strong Jewish identity, it allowed me to you know, play soccer with the Haitians and hang out with the Jamaicans and talk to the Greeks and Italians. And I think it made me a much more well-rounded person uh, socially. So I'm, I'm presuming that you probably have a similar story to tell. Absolutely. And it's, it's funny because, you know, I grew up, I grew up in Prince George's County, Maryland, which is a predominantly, um, is a majority African-American um, uh, county in Maryland and very integrated, very, very warm and um, I guess the, most of the Jews and, and whites, white flighted out of there. Um, and I went to public school for a bunch of years until I switched uh, eventually from middle school uh, to Jewish school. And what's funny about it is, you know, I grew up, you know, these were our friends, our neighbors, and, you know, very close friends of my families were African-American. And then I went to all these institutions in which whites who didn't know any African-Americans were always lecturing me about them. And it was it was an indication to me that a lot of the so-called experts have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah, no kidding. Listen, uh, I live in the world where that's most common. It's called academia. Uh, <laughs> I mean, by the way, I mean, uh, I discuss in my book trans the transgender activism, but but to sort of uh, make the point broader that what I just said, all the idea pathogens that I you know enumerate and discuss in my book all stem from academia. So, you know, it really takes, I, I keep reminding this to people and they, they think I'm trying to be, you know, jocular and funny, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm being literal. It takes intellectuals to come up with the dumbest ideas. How, how, do, you, how do you explain that? Why, why is that? It's a good question. I, I don't know why intellectuals, I mean, it's amazing how, how much they make things complicated that aren't. Uh, I mean, yeah. obviously there are things that are complicated. Yeah. I'm sort of caught because I think, you know, people like to beat up, you know, beat up on the left for introducing these things, you know, these, these sort of pathogenic ideas and, and, and parasitic ideas to, to our uh, uh, a culture. And I think that's appropriate. And I think they like to beat up on liberals for failing to speak up. Um, and that, that, that's appropriate, too. But there's a problem with conservatives as well. Conservatives let all this happen. And they let it happen, I think, for two reasons. Um one, if they responded, they responded in such a crude way without having any depth of understanding about these issues. And you do have to know something about them. You can't just say, well, that's stupid. Um, that's, that's not a response or this is madness over and over and over. I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't move the ball forward. Um, and, and, or, or they were, you know, they thought, you know, this has nothing to do with me. I'm just going to throw my hands up and let this overtake the culture. So, um, you know, I, I guess I guess we all have our our, our blame in, in what's happened uh, across you know North America, um, but you know I, I really do hope we can turn some of this around. Right. Uh, well, in in so the, in your book you talk about some of the activists who are really trying to create chaos and you know disorder and so on, and we'll talk about them uh, in a second. But I, I think a lot of the academics. So to answer the my. The question that I posed you about, you know, why do intellectuals come up with really the dumb ideas? I think that a lot of the uh, originators of these ideas 
do so because they are caught in a world that is decoupled from the uh, downstream effects of their imbecilic ways, right? So for example, the reason why in the humanities or in some of the social sciences, you're able to have a much greater, you know, a parasitic infestation of this kind of stupidity is because, you know, you, you can pontificate on these issues. Now, eventually there are real downstream consequences of this stuff because the, 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 the parasitic ideas break, break out of the lab, so to speak, out of the university settings and they become, you know, part of our HR departments and our military and our politics and our culture and Hollywood and so on. So, and journalism, but, Originally, you can sit there in front of an admiring group of students who don't know any better, pontificate about, you know, up is down, left is right, and there are no real consequences to you doing that. The reason why I think in engineering, or I'm housed in a business school, uh, the reason why the business school or the engineering school is less parasitized by this nonsense is because the testing of your stupidity happens you know, in vivo, it happens immediately, right? So you cannot build a bridge using postmodernist physics. You cannot build a model of consumer choice to try to predict how the economy is got using postmodernist mathematics. So you're coupled to reality and therefore that kind of inoculates you against stupidity. Whereas in, in these other highfalutin gibberish fields, you can say whatever you want and there are no consequences. Well, let me put back, push back on you for a second, because sure. I think that's broadly true, but here's my problem with it. At some point, you need people with integrity to stand up and say, but that's not true, that's a lie. And I think that buildings do collapse. We just saw one collapse in Miami. And as we have woke doctors, which we have, yeah. we have activist doctors, we also have are starting to have activist scientists, woke scientists. So... I know some very good doctors and very good scientists who are very concerned about these trends. And the ones, even the ones who will speak up, they, they, they can't write the refutations fast enough. The amount of funding that's pouring into this baloney um, research is, is, is so fast. Um, the people in charge of the funding are, are often woke um, increasingly. So um, I do think that unfortunately there, it is possible to undermine even the hard disciplines. We're seeing that in academia right now. Um, you know, Heather McDonald's book, uh, The Diversity Delusion, talks about the fact that in, in uh, Berkeley, I think it was, they're now um, basically changing the even hard science curriculum like chemistry to involve sort of a woke chemistry kind of thing co component. So I, I, unfortunately, you still, the whole system, I think, relies on people of integrity and, and we just don't have enough who are willing to stand up right now. Uh, well, I, I actually, I completely agree with you. I mean, my point was simply that it, it takes longer for it to be parasitized. It's not immune, right? Uh, and I completely, I mean, I, I live in that world. So I know, you know, physical chemists who have been, well, a physical chemist who has been denied a grant because his uh, grant didn't pass the die statement diversity inclusion and equity so it didn't matter whether the subsequent uh, uh grant application was going to you know cure diabetes or or cancer what what mattered is that you didn't adhere to whatever die statement so so oh absolutely i mean the infestation is happening everywhere uh now okay so let's go down to the chaos and uh, uh did you call it chaos and disorder what was what was your explanation for why the activists are doing it what well, use two terms Oh, they, they, they certainly chaos is, is, is a goal. I mean, I, what are they looking for? I think they're looking for recruits. Okay, uh, but, but what? But I mean, not so. Okay, so yeah. so they are the, the guys who are the Antifa folks and or, or who are trying to recruit into Antifa or BLM. As you mentioned, a lot of the, 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 the folks who, you know, who become transgender might might sort of be gravitating in terms of political activism to, to that camp. But surely the, the physician that you mentioned may not be trying to... So is it cowardice that's causing them to toe the line? What, so what are all the different motives that cause people to unquestionably go against this book? Well, um, first of all, a lot of it's sold a lot. People are reading it. People are writing me private messages. I, t I talked about this week on Barry Weiss. I'm flooded with them, even from people at leftist places. So even all the way to the left, not even just liberals, but the left are reading it, appreciating and whatnot. But the problem is wherever they are, they know they can lose their jobs. So for instance, I wrote about this as well for Quillette that um, there's a National Association of Science Writers 
in uh, they have a listserv, a online forum, in which a member of the forum mentioned my book. He hadn't even read it yet, and he said this book seems like interesting and worth reading, and. Um, he was kicked off the discussion forum. These are by science writers. These are science journalists wow. tasked with explaining phenomena to the public. So you see why no one will spend. So, of course, I find out about it. Why? Because one of the liberal members of Na National Association of Science Writers wrote to me. She was horrified that science is being, you know, science journalism is being, you know, censored in this way. And just last week, um, a, a favorable review by a doctor of my book was deleted. It was oh yes, down. I that's right. I heard about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So scientists, of good scientists with integrity, are not able to get their message to the public right now. But that's, I mean, so it. I often say that we need to update the seven deadly sins to include an eighth deadly sin, cowardice. So in in many of their cases, that's what's happening, right? I mean, yes, I'm 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 on board with what Abigail Schreier is saying, but I simply don't have the necessary fortitude. To, to you know to activate my inner honey badger and therefore I will toe the line and be quiet right right I mean part of it is I, I think there's um, you know there's a, it's it's really asymmetrical it only takes one person to accuse a book of transphobia to get it removed but it takes and you know Amazon then put my book through a series of reviews for a, they had a, appointed a whole committee to read every go over every page and they decided it didn't have transphobia in it um so the book was allowed to stay but but you see the resources it takes one twitter user to have the book eliminated wow right to get the book eliminated but it takes all these resources of people combing through the book to make sure there's no transphobia in it so you see what what an advantage they have that's amazing so i i i remember the amazon situation Target pulled it, but then reinstated it, correct? And then pulled it again. Oh, I didn't know about the... Oh, yeah. so now officially it's not carried by gone. Target? Oh, it's gone. Okay. Yeah, and as it... soon as there was no public outcry and no one was paying attention, they got rid of it again. They also got rid of Deborah So's book the same way, The End of Gender. Amazing. And uh, then there was the Halifax Public Library situation. Maybe tell us a bit, a bit about that. Sure. The Halifax Public Library, you know... There are so many people who want to read this book that there are now nearly 150 people on a waiting list to read it in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is really unbelievable. Wow. I mean, 150 people are desperate to read this book. They've all put their names down. And um, a handful of um, trans activists got very angry. They said, we don't want this book. It makes us feel unsafe. These were biological men. Um, who, are, who are trans, you know, present as, as women. They said it, they claimed that it made them feel unsafe. And for once, the Halifax Library said, no, I'm sorry, we're a library for books. We have a million, over a million volumes in this library. Wow. And they have gotten no public support. They are standing alone. And this is coming to every library across North America. If you let the bullies win, they will just move on to the next book. Well, I'm going to support what you, you just said in terms of your prediction. I spoke at the Jewish Public Library right here in Montreal. This was in April. Uh, I was going to, sp well, I did speak about the well my book. And uh, I, find, I found out, not unlike how the person that contacted you to tell you about the, the liberal science journalist, that was, you know, being kicked off. Uh, some people who themselves, I think, are liberal and, and uh, uh, quote, progressive, wrote to me, you know, with in complete indignation, saying that there's a whole movement in the in the back scene that's trying to get you deplatformed because you know you're a you know horrible hate monger and so on. So it first started as I'm transphobic and homophobic, uh, and then I released some photos of me walking in the Berlin uh, gay parade with all sorts of very colorful figures and then in the Rio de Janeiro uh, parade where I'm like I'm like in a tsunami of all sorts of LGBTQ folks so now that couldn't stick anymore so now the next one that ca they came up with well I went after uh, LeBron James and BLM and so on so I'm hateful against uh, you know black people and so on so so it kept it kept changing why I was hateful but to their credit, not unlike the Halifax Public Library, the Jewish Public Library said, no, he's coming to speak. And I spoke. And apparently after the talk, there wasn't a single complaint, even by all of the super scared people. And not one of them levied a, a rebuttal or a complaint. So if you do stand up, they usually do go away. 
They do. I mean, that's the, that's the sort of the secret is that if you don't budge, they go away. They go on to another target. We just need more people willing to stand up for free speech. I mean, you know, look, my book not only has, you know, broad readership, but it also has transgender support. Not every, you know, most of the transgender adults I've spoken to, and I know a lot of them, um, don't want teenagers transitioning with no safeguards and going through irreversible processes that they're likely to regret. That's not something transgender adults want. Um, The activists want it. But, you know, healthy, normal transgender adults, do. that's not something they support. Lesbians are very concerned about this because almost every lesbian I talk to, and frankly, almost every woman will say to me, you know, at some point I hated my body too. If this had been an option for me, I might have done it. <laughs> well, I, in, in, in the parasitic mind, I'm not sure. And forgive me, I haven't yet gone very carefully through your book. I don't know if you discuss it, but in, in, in my book, I talk about several Canadian specific cases dealing with the transgender activism, one of which is this uh, now become sort of an infamous person who goes from, you know, uh, wax, waxing place to waxing place. Do, do you know the story? Just you know? you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, it, the, the sort of the meme has become wax my testicles, but put in a more colorful language. And of course, that came to a sort of the singularity poke, uh, singularity point of wokeism when that stunt went against a, a waxer who was a Muslim woman. So now she says, well, I this goes against my beliefs. This goes, so now you have, who's going to win the oppression Olympics? Is it the transgender person who's saying, but it doesn't matter if I've got male genitalia, I'm a woman, so you have to wax me versus the Muslim woman. Did you, did you know about this story? Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, I would just say that I think it's such a mistake to even, you know, compete in the oppression Olympics. Because, you know, who cares who's the most oppressed group? The question is, are these teen girls getting the appropriate care? Forget about how the teen girls, whether they win in the oppression Olympics, are they getting good care? They're entitled to good medical care. Or are they being subjected to completely ineffectual safeguards, almost no oversight, and engaging in highly experimental medical treatments without, you know, that they're very likely to regret? Yeah, that's that's unbelievable. Now, if I if we compare the types of mechanisms that are in place today, if if any, that that says, okay, you you you're now coming to see me. I'm a therapist or whatever, or a physician that that is a trans medicine specialist. Uh, if we compare, what are the steps that you have to go through before you go down the the the, the road of transformation to say in the 1970s and 80s when I first sort of learned about this stuff when you had transsexual operations I'm going to go on a limb and say that that protocol is unbelievably more rigorous than the current protocol is that true yes that's the whole problem is that you know in the Toronto Cam H facility which has you know the premier gender you know gender dysphoria clinic um, and I interviewed the, the doctors both Ken Zucker and Ray Blanchard Um, Dr. Blanchard was responsible for evaluating patients to see whether they were prepared for gender reassignment surgery. And he did this, you know, and the, with other doctors, not to be cruel to people who wanted to transition. He did this because transitioning is very difficult. It's very hard and stressful to pass yourself off as the opposite sex. And they wanted to make sure that if they were allowing people to go through these you know, irreversible um, medical procedures that they wouldn't regret it. They did not want suicide on their hands. And that's why they did have gatekeeping and oversight. Today, you walk into a clinic across America. We went from, I think, two in 2017, or sorry, two in 2012, to now we have 300 um, in in, in the United States. And you walk into a clinic, you walk out that day with a course of testosterone. The age at which you're able to obtain it varies by state you know, in organs 15, and you, you don't even have to see a doctor. You just sign a waiver, an informed consent waiver, and you walk out that day with a course of testosterone that will forever change your body. So what is the justification for having gone from a very rigorous protocol for gender reassignment surgeries to what where we are today? Is, is the idea that, well, there is so much psychological damage that happens to me in experiencing gender dysphoria that we just need to intervene right away. There is no time for protocol, protocol. Is that, is that the general idea? 
Yes. I mean, basically, the standards changed in 2012. WPATH changed its standards and moved to an informed consent model. That, that meant that there would no longer be oversight. They would just say, you can come in, sign a waiver that you understand the risks. You're an adult. So if you understand the risks, go for it. Um, you know, it was something the activists really pushed for. I'm not sure it was best for even adult patients who really, you know, transgender adults often say that they really appreciate the therapy they went through beforehand to make sure that this was the right. They, they were very confident when they finally made the choice. It took a period of years um, in, in CAMH under Dr. Blanchard's um, oversight. It typically took two years. Um, and it, it was something that they were really ready for. And, and there are people as a result who are transgender who are really flourishing, I, I think in part because there was oversight. And they did away with that. And now, um, you know, even even people who have the fleeting thought, gosh, I, you know, I really wish I could ch get out of this body. They can walk into a clinic and that day walk out with testosterone. Unbelievable. Uh, so, OK, so w maybe I should ask this at the start of our conversation. What is it that because I often I mean, if, if I'm speaking to a specialist in a field, there's no point in me asking him, why did you write a book in the specialty of your field? That's what he's he or she has been training right. in all of that. But in your case, you could sample of why as a freelance journalist, there's all sorts of buffets of, you know, intellectual variety places where you can go. And yet you decided, well, something triggered me to cause me to focus on dealing with this issue, writing this book and so on. What is it for you? Is it something personal? Is it what? What's the journey? I, uh... I was in the middle, I had already written a proposal sort of for a feminist update about how young women were doing. And at the time, while I was working on this, I also had um, a woman write to me, a mom, who told me that she had written to many, many journalists and couldn't get anyone to take up this issue. But her daughter had gone off to college, no history of gender dysphoria, but a lot of mental health problems. And with a group of girlfriends, they all decided they were transgender and she had started a course of testosterone. And the woman told me that this was happening across the country. It was a real phenomenon. I had read about it from Lisa Lippman's study. And um, I tried to get an investigative journalist to pick it up and I, because I mostly did opinion journalism and I couldn't find anyone. So I waited three months. I had given it to one investigative reporter who was supposed to follow it. Nobody wanted to touch this issue. And that's when I finally thought, okay, if nobody's going to touch this issue, I'll look into it. And I wrote one piece for the Wall Street Journal on it. It got, you know, over a thousand comments. There was a re reply in the New York Times and that had a thousand, you know, many, many hundred comments. And now I had all this material and I was hoping to put this issue behind me. <laughs> but um, my, my agent actually said, you know, if you want to write about young women, this is a pretty interesting thing about that's happening to young women today. So why don't you write about that? Wow, interesting. So, okay, you, you focus on uh, women. That, so the social contagion mechanism predominantly affects women for the, some of the reasons that we mentioned earlier. How Give us any of the relevant epidemiological facts in terms of, well, first we know that it's about 0.01% of actual transgender folks, right? Is that, is that number correct? Well, that's what, yeah, that was the last, you know, that, that was one, you know, it's, it's hard to know if it's correct. I mean, yes, that was in the DSM, the official man, psychiatric manual. And, you know, there's a range and some people say that was suppressed because of stigma. So now that we're leading with less stigma, it's hard to separate. But yeah, that was the traditional. But it's number. an extraordinarily small number in the order of one Very in 10,000. Okay. Now, how many of the sort of... Uh, I don't want to say legitimate, but the ones that we absolutely know that they suffer from gender dysphoria, what's the ratio of female to male versus male to female? So it was almost entirely male. I don't, I think it's one in 30,000 for women. So it would be 0.003% for women. So very small numbers. Um, and now it's overwhelmingly uh, young teenage girls. And do we know in the, in the legitimate established right manifestations of gender dysphoria, why there is such an imbalance in the sex ratios of in the two ways? Do we know why that is? That's super, That's very interesting. I, I don't know if we do know, I, I, I can tell you what, what I do know, which is that Dr. Blanchard looked at the different types of, of um, uh, you know, the, of manifestations. And, and there are, um, there are, you know, what he calls autogynophiles, men who are aroused by themselves, um, the thought of themselves in women's clothing, these are generally heterosexual men. Um, and then there are gay men. And historically, most of them outgrew it. By the way, there's no 
correlate to autogynophiles for women. We've never had women who are aroused by themselves, you know, the idea of themselves as men. So you, um, but, but most of these people would grow up to be just homosexual adults and, and some of them would become what we used to call transsexuals, but a very small minority. And I mean, here it's a, one has to be careful how, how we discuss this because the minute that you try to argue that you're going to try to explain, for example, why homosexuality exists or you're pathologizing, well, you're not doing it. It's a, it's a real phenomenon. You're not trying to stigmatize anyone, but you want to understand, you know, is it a developmental thing? Is it an in utero thing? Right. So what are the current best accepted scientific explanations for why gender dysphoria exists without any moral judgment right you're not you're not putting a a, a tag on the explanation w why it happens do we know at all the proximate mechanisms no I'm, I'm not sure that we do i mean there are theories that it has to do with um testosterone right. um in, 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 in utero in utero that's exactly yeah. what i was going to predict okay right yeah but but I'm not sure that anything's been definitively proved. I mean, I know that that's true for um, homosexuality. They say that um, you know Dr. Blanchard has a theory um, that's now widely accepted that um, homosexuality can is linked to um, uterine you know the maternal um, uh, intolerance for testosterone um, with subsequent boys. So the more the the woman the mom builds up a uh, resistance to testosterone um, with with subsequent sons. Got you. Okay. So okay, moving on from you know transgender issue to other things that keep Honey Badger Abigail Schreier staying up at night with insomnia. What are some other issues that are pissing you off and that we might expect a book in the future? Like what what are some other things that kind of cause you to experience moral indignation? Oh, it's interesting. Well, one thing is you know. I, I think that we could write about sort of the corruption of our institutions forever because we have a huge problem, and that is that the ACLU no longer, you know, protects speech. The ADL is no longer about combating anti-Semitism. Um, you know, you could, the New York Times is no longer a, even as a goal of, of reporting the truth. Um, I, I wonder, we're, we're all living with the consequences of the failure of our institution, the corruption of our institutions, and, and not nearly enough is being done to point it out. And is there a way to, I mean, what, I know that in, in your Hillsdale uh, address, uh, you said, look, this book is not about, you know, because someone asked you, well, what, what do I tell my 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 daughter's friend or whatever mother and you said well the book is not really a prescriptive book you, you didn't use those terms but but it was really let's try to understand the phenomenon but if i ask you okay so you just mentioned all these problems that are happening across many different institutions what would be off the top of your head some ways by which we can tr start to redress the, the problem sure the most important thing is that every american needs to know and, and canadians you know for your institutions as well that these institutions no longer represent what you think they do right they they don't they've been completely corrupted you cannot get the adl in a non-biased way to stand up to anti-semitism it won't do it you can't get the ADL, aclu to pro to stand up for free speech in a principled manner it won't do it you can't get our legacy media outlets to report the news in a unbiased way. It will not do it. Um, and so we really need to look to alternatives. Wow. Well, I mean, one of the things that I talk about in my book is uh, the universities losing their uh, stomach for supporting an ethos of meritocracy, right? I mean, meritocracy, as we now know, is a form of white supremacy, right? The scientific method itself is only one of many ways of knowing, right? So, so for example, in Canada, quite differently i think from you know realities in the us uh, the entire institutions of higher learning are being indigenized right now to to be indigenized could mean a reasonably you know tepid thing i mean uh, at the graduation ceremonies you know they do the land uh, the land acknowledgement stuff right uh, this land is on uh, iroquois stolen land right uh, now now i actually object to that because Every land that exists anywhere on earth was at some point stolen or fought for by someone else, right? So we better be given back Saudi Arabia to the Jewish tribes that were there because they certainly were there before uh, Islam came along, okay? So so th that is already that forensic uh, 
audit of who owns what is completely silly. I mean, it's even more silly in an immediate way in that the, the, the young adults who are being honored at, say, a graduation ceremony have nothing to do with the guilt that may have happened 300 years earlier. So why are we taking the moment to honor them to sort of have them flagellate in sort of this collective orgiastic guilt? But here's the worst part, Abigail. I, okay, I'm willing to tolerate all this nonsense, but when you start saying that the scientific method is only one of many ways of knowing, that's when this honey badger gets triggered, right? Because it's the only way of knowing. Now, this doesn't mean, for example, if you have Inuit folks, uh, Native Canadians who live in, uh, in lands for 10,000 years, they may have knowledge about the flora and fauna that is unique to their experience. And we may turn to them with complete humility and say, hey, teach us. But the way you adjudicate scientific questions, there is no indigenous epistemology, just like there isn't a Lebanese Jewish way epistemology. There's only the scientific method way. So that's certainly one thing that keeps me up at night. What do you think of this? I, I, I totally agree. And, and I think, you know, we're very much on the same page about this. I mean, there's been such an erosion of common sense. And one way that a lot of parents have gotten themselves in this situation is when they notice something wrong at school, their, taught, their kids were being taught some funny things that they certainly didn't believe, like they could choose their own gender. They, they, they relied on experts to tell them whether it was appropriate or not. They didn't trust themselves. And we really need to go back to trusting ourselves. Parents need to trust themselves. If they see a kid in harm way, physicians need to trust themselves. If, if, if something does not seem appropriate medically to them, they need to speak up. And, and in science as well, I mean, we believe the scientific method was absolutely ingenious. It was arrived at over, you know, hundreds of years and um, of, of, you know, exploration. And instead, we now have activist doctors who begin with the conclusion. Right. They already know the answer and they are truly evidence proof. We're seeing this. The activist doctors in the gender area are evidence proof. They produce bad science. They, they, no matter how many times it's disproven, they come back to it. They get celebrated in the New York Times. And unfortunately, they're really pushing a whole generation toward harm. Yeah, you know, I, I loved when you said, you know, b believe in, your, in yourself. One of the, the best way, I mean, you know, there's a term gaslighting, right? But one of the best ways that you can create an ethos of intellectual terrorism, intellectual terrorism is the term that I use for postmodernism because it really is complete nihilism, right? It's, it's up is down, left is right. There are no objective truths. Everything is subjective. We're shackled by our personal identity. So how can we talk about truth? So it's perfectly anti-scientific. Well, imagine when you can push this kind of nonsense enough, you know, with enough alacrity, what do you end up getting? You end up getting someone who writes to me. This is a this is an actual real story where they say, uh, you know, you're you're the big expert professor on sex differences and so on. Is it okay for me to tell my children or whatever that that only women menstruate or is that no longer? So the fact that you, that an adult has to write to me to receive confirmation as to whether only women menstruate or not, or, and whether that is true or not, that is exactly what you're speaking about. They don't trust their sense of sense-making enough to even address the most basic of banalities, right? That's right, and I think the re part of the reason this happened in the United States is across the political spectrum, um, people's number one concern is, have I mastered the lingo? <laughs> did I right? Did I get it right? I don't want to offend anyone. Yeah. Well, the, the the point of language is not to avoid offense. The point of language is to speak clearly and communicate ideas clearly. And we've stopped doing that. We think now that, that the point of language is to make other people feel good. That that might be the point of therapy in a certain sense or or a life coaching, but it's definitely not the point of language. Arguably, it's not even the point of therapy. <laughs> Wow, incredible. So what, if someone were to ask you, uh, and I'm sure you receive a million of those emails, give me the prescription. So for you, it would be just be, an, be, be a counter activist, right? So you want to fight against CRT, go to your uh, uh, school board meetings, as now is happening in large part due to Christopher Rufo, another honey badger. Right. Yeah, I think number one, social media is how a lot of these kids um, discover this. Social media puts them in contact, including things like YouTube, puts them in contact with 
um, activists and adults that you would never let into your home. Um, they, they are people who have, you know, certainly no expertise, are probably bad influences, and their videos queue up automatically. And these are not people you want guiding your troubled teenager, but they are um, in very, very large numbers. Um, and, and social media, social media makes, makes kids feel terrible about themselves. And, and yet they're always on it. And parents let them be. Uh, because they, they aren't willing to put their foot down. But I know it's hard, but getting your kid off social media is a really big deal. Now, the older the kids get, the harder it is. Oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to try to remember what point, the timestamp of you said, what you just said so I can show it to my children because I think it, it was easier to uh, go through the Lebanese Civil War as I did than to actually, you know, pry from my children's hands that the, the social, it's unbelievable. Right. But, but here's the crazy part about it. If you said to any adult who says, I can't get the teen, you know, my kids off their iPhone, if you said to any of them, wait a second, now let's go back to 2012. And I'm going to tell you that the rates of teenage cutting, depression, and anxiety have, will skyrocket because of this device. Will you let your kid have it? We would have all said no. Amazing. But here we are pretending our hands are tied. I know it's hard, but you're talking about mental illness. You're talking about excruciating pain. You're talking about kids who hate their bodies and hate themselves. Get them off this horrible thing. It's so true. What about for adults? I mean, you and I are, you know, in the public eye. Uh, of course, there are mental health issues for, you know, in navigating through social media, not just for teenagers who, of course, are in a precarious situation. They're still developing. But even for, well, I'll speak for myself, for an old old guy like me or, or a much younger uh, individual like you, there are still repercussions on yeah. being. So, what, what's what's your sort of social media hygiene, if if you have any, that you try to adhere to? You know, I I can't say that I'm great about it for myself as a journalist. The way that I get you know pieces out is through Twitter. I'm you know, there's no question that I use it a lot um, in order to communicate with other people. I I can't say. I would just say that you know. It's even, social media is even hard on me, there's no question. And if I were, you know, when someone doesn't respond to me and the, the kind of things that, te that drive teenage girls absolutely nutty uh, with pain. I mean, it causes them terrible pain um, not to have their photos liked, to feel ugly next to their friends all the time. And I would just say, you know, adults, whatever they think is right for themselves, you know, I guess adults need to make that, you know, evaluation on their own. but. But for kids, they've got to get off this. It's awful, and they have to band with other parents and just agree that that everyone's going to have a regular flip phone and enough of this. I amen. Okay, uh, as we come to the towards the end of our chat, I, of course we could chat for hours. Uh, are you? Do you feel comfortable telling us about any upcoming uh, projects that you might be working on using this platform to promote it or discuss it? Please go ahead. Tell oh, us thank about you. It. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm doing a, a few investigations right now into some of the topics we've talked about and, and the implications of um, you know woke wokeism into various disciplines. But I'll just say I'm also going to be uh, writing a book on uh, again on this generation because they do fascinate me. So um, I'll I'll, uh, I'll return to this generation. I hope for my next book. And hopefully you will come back on the show to tell us all about it. Absolutely, you got it.